Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is Mark Gold, our speaker. And uh, I have a very long bio here for him, but I'll just read a few sentences from it so that we can get started sooner. Uh, Mark is the director of the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, and he's also the longtime president of Heal the Bay. Uh, Mark has his doctorate in environmental science and engineering from UCLA, and currently he's working on developing an integrated water management approach for the city of LA that will maximize water quality benefits while optimizing water supply, flood control, habitat, and recreational open space benefits. Uh, so without further delay, I'm going to send uh, pass the mic to, oh, he has his arm I got my mic. Okay. All right, thanks. All right. All right, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, so background-wise, for those of you guys who live in the region, so I was the first hire ever at the environmental group Heal the Bay. Um, and I worked there for 23 years um, and uh, ran the organization for almost 20 years. Um, so I did that first before coming back to UCLA. Uh, the university's meant an awful lot to me. Um, I, I got all my degrees there. I met my wife there. I was born there. My brothers went there. It's pretty pathetic. And now my, my, my son, who's finishing his degree um, in marine biology from Stanford, so water seems to be the family business, um, is actually going to be coming back and doing his PhD at UCLA in marine biology. So it, it, there is a big Bruin connection here. So a lot going on in water. Um, and uh, really, I'm going to go through things pretty quickly on sort of what's going on in the state and water, what's going on locally on the, on the water issues. And, but this is going to be a lot more enjoyable for everybody once we start getting into Q&A and whatever questions you may have on that. Um, another thing just for background on the water side is that I also sit on the, the mayor of LA, uh, Eric Garcetti's uh, water cabinet. So there's a group of, of, of people who uh, at Department of Water and Power, Bureau of Sanitation, et cetera. And I'm, I'm one of the people who are, I'm pretty much the only outsider, if you will, who's on that group. All right, so California drought. You guys have probably seen this sort of diagram um, that come out once a week. And this pretty much says we're screwed. Um, and so uh, as you can see, the vast, the whole state is pretty much in drought. And the vast majority of the, of the state um, is in what's called exceptional drought. I always thought extreme was worse than exceptional, but not, not for the drought monitor. Um, and so what you can see, obviously, is that uh, what's really extraordinary about this is you don't see it this looking like this um, in April, May. Um, generally, there's snowpack, those sorts of things. There's the Sierra. Anyone having a good ski year locally? I don't think so. Um, and so we basically have a Sierra Nevada that's completely devoid of snowpack. Um, and so it's not, it's bad enough that uh, this is the fourth year of an extreme drought, um, the worst one in the last century plus that people have been measuring. Um, but on top of that, it's not going to get better for the next five months. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe if we have a wet winter, that'll be some relief, um, but that's a long ways away. There's not water that's going to be running off the Sierras in a real big way and replenishing um, our water supply system. So, um, pretty, pretty scary times that are unprecedented in state history. Um, we, you know, literally the last time they measured, less than 5% of um, snowpack compared to a normal year in the Sierras. And now it's literally at zero. Um, so it's, it's just an incredible, incredible time. So you see how extreme the issue is. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the state and some of the things we're doing. You know, I'm from UCLA. I have to talk a little bit about what we're doing as well. So we're doing something pretty exceptional at UCLA. It's called our uh, Grand Challenge, um, and it's a sustainable LA focused. Uh, and so there's two of these that our university are doing. And uh, one of them is on the environment um, and uh, how do you make Los Angeles truly sustainable, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the second one's on depression. And I don't know if it was sequenced that way intentionally because anyone who works on the environment is going to be depressed, but um, that, those are the two things that we've decided to go for so far. And a lot of this was inspired by, um, we have a, someone in our atmospheric and oceanic sciences, a very well-known professor named Alex Hall. 
um, who was uh, one of the lead authors on the IPCC climate change report, um, and he was the, the lead on chapter 13, the climate modeling section. And what, what he did was, he was the first person to really do this downscale of a me major metropolitan area. And he did this on the LA, air, LA area a few years ago. And what he found, he looked at temperature, precipitation, snowfall, um, Santa Ana, and uh, wildfire risk, um, among other things, and, and using uh, the various different climate models out there and, and his downscaling techniques. And the sorts of things that he found, and I should have brought a map of this, um, was that you know, on average, a four to five degree increase by 2050 using the various different models that are out there. Precipitation, believe it or not, remains about the same. Santa Ana's don't really change a huge amount. Snow snowfall um, in the, our local mountains would decrease um, by 50%. Um, and wildfire risk goes up substantially just because of heat. And then there are some areas that really would suffer disproportionate heat Im impacts. Those of you who live near the coast, you're golden. Those of you who live inland, um, if you live in the San Gabriel Valley or San Fernando Valley, you're screwed. Um, so the number of extreme days goes up dramatically um, over 95 degrees um, within those areas. So the thought was, well, what can we do? Are we just going to sit idly by for the next 35 years and just turn into Phoenix? Or um, is there something we can do to sort of thrive in a hotter Los Angeles? And so that's where this research concept came up. How do you get um, people to break across silos, work together on these sorts of research areas? And so what we said was 100% renewable energy, 100% um, locally sourced water, and enhanced ecosystem health by 2050. The grand challenges are supposed to be really grand. Um, and we have 150 faculty working um, on, on these issues. Um, it's, it's a big thing that we've literally just started. Our research plan should be done by the end of June. I bring that up because obviously a significant part of that is how do we get to 100% locally sourced water. To put that in perspective, right now in the city of Los Angeles, um, any guesses on how much uh, we get local water supply? What percentage? 5%? Great. Make me look worse. Thanks. 11%. Jeez, no, way more than that. Double what you think. Um, so yeah, 11%. Um, the other 89% comes from more than 200 miles away. Not exactly the definition of sustainability in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Locally sourced, um, by the definition, would be, is it coming from LA? So it would be local groundwater or local recycled water. So that, that's what that would be. And we'll get a little more into that in a minute. All right, so one of the things that, um, that uh, we just put out at the university, um, and I was, I was the lead on, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't, was um, uh, we did an environmental report card for all of Los Angeles County. Um, and, uh, and so this came out about a month ago. And uh, there's a significant water section in here uh, among other things, we looked at water, air, um, greenhouse gas emissions, climate, um, uh, environmental quality of life, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive look on the data that's available that's truly countywide on what's being monitored on a regular basis. Um, one of the things also, so you heard how bad LA was on local water. Overall, um, we get uh, roughly 42% of our water from local water supplies in LA County. So that means 58% is imported from more than 200 miles away. So we've definitely got an issue on, on where our water is coming from and how much better can we actually do on that. And so this was, this was just something we put together to, um, to sort of give some examples of, uh, of, of some of the reasons why overall the LA region, we ended up giving a, a C on water, this was water quality and water supply both. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have on, on water supply as well. Um, I, I seem to do a lot of report cards. I created Gila Bay's beach report card, beach water quality report card, way back in 1990. It now grades more than 500 beaches along the whole west coast of um, the United States. Um, and so now I'm grading again um, how we're doing overall on, on water. And water quality um, is, is very, very poor for our groundwater supply um, in a big way. So when we talk about how do we get more out of our local groundwater, that's a big impediment is that we have a lot of historical um, chemical contamination from things like uh, uh, solvents, uh, perchlorate is another example. Um, so there's a wide variety of different contaminants that are, are posing problems within our groundwater, which makes it tougher to get the most out of it. 
So what's interesting is, so we put this report card out um, uh, about a month ago. And uh, about two years before that, in 2012, uh, we did something a little bit novel for a university, which is we put together a sustainable city plan for LA. It was aspirational. What would we want a sustainable city to actually look like in Los Angeles? And so we put that out in 2012, um, right before the mayoral primary. And so we were lucky enough that both Mayor Garcetti and um, then council person, uh, or actually then controller, Gruel, uh, Wendy Gruel, both endorsed the plan. Um, and what ended up happening once, once Eric got elected was he said he was going to put together the city of LA's first ever sustainable city plan. And so that happened. And that came out the day after the environmental report card. So I guess that was sort of intentional on their part because I've been working with the city on, on their project as well, on their sustainable city plan, um, in that they get a bad grade one day and then the next day say, oh, well, we're going to do a lot better from now on. So really the hit was pretty minimized for them on, on what they were doing. But there were some transformational things within their plan that I think are important for you guys to take note of. One which you hear about all the time was the 20% conservation goal by January 2017, which is really a huge deal. I mean, if we're on average using 130 gallons per capita per day, um, and what that means, just so you know, is total water use divided by population, not necessarily residential water use. It's a different number. So a lot of times you'll see different numbers that are, that are compared that are apples and oranges. Um, and so the 20% reduction would get us down to about 104 gallons per capita per day in a very short period of time. Um, and so that's a, a pretty ambitious goal on the mayor's part to do something that quickly. And a lot of times when these sorts of things have happened before, um, it, it's been uh, a lot of times sort of temporary measures just based on education and that sort of thing, whereas people can revert back to their wasteful ways um, pretty quickly. The city's trying to do a lot more than that. Obviously, the most prominent thing that you hear about is paying people way too much money to change out their lawns because they really want to provide a tremendous incentive um, for people to do so right away because that's a permanent change. Um, if you're getting rid of a very thirsty lawn and putting in um, uh, native plants, then that's going to make a, a huge, huge difference, especially when on average, and this is true for for um, urban areas um, uh, within the LA region, we use over 50% of our residential water uses on outdoor irrigation. So that's, that's the area where we can really make the most difference. And to put that in perspective on some of the other things, so a lot of times people focus on indoor and fixtures and those sorts of things, like, oh, do you have the latest low flush toilet, or do you have the right aerators, um, water restrictors, et cetera? What are you using for your dishwasher? What are you using for your washing machine? Those sorts of things. Those are really critical. But to put that in perspective, when I first started working at Heal the Bay back in um, 1988, the average flow coming into the Hyperion treatment plant, so that's the sewage going into that big coastal plant that you see on the beach, you know, sort of right near El Segundo, that area, um, was around 400 million gallons a day. Um, today, um, actually, the, the lowest was peak recession. They averaged 254 million gallons per day at that plant. Um, obviously, population increased. What happened? What happened was people have actually done a pretty good job on indoor conservation. Um, and so back then, everyone had five gallon flush toilets. You know, now, you know, everybody's got at least a 1.6, a lot more 1.2s. They're just, you know, now people are talking about putting in 0.8s. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of water uh, conservation effort that has occurred there. You know, the same thing, whatever you buy today on, on, a, on a dishwasher or in a washing machine is a heck of a lot more water efficient than it was, obviously, decades ago. All right, so the other transformative, uh, long-term transformative goal that's in this plan, which is very helpful for our UCLA Grand Challenge, is the 50% reduction in imported water by 2035. And so that's a big, big deal. And it's one of those things where you just look at the number, and a lot of times you don't think about, OK, so what does that actually mean? Well, what that means is, rather than having to get all of our water from the Colorado River, um, or you know, this year, not quite so much, and last year, not so much coming from the Bay Delta area, um, last year, we only got 5% of our allocation in Metropolitan Water District. This year's 20%. Um, that 
you know, and, and then if you look at the water coming from the Eastern Sierras, from the LA aqueduct, so those are the three imported water sources within, within the um, city of LA, two of those are pretty much dried up. So you, we, we have full allocation from the Colorado River. You can imagine how bad a state we would be in right now if, uh, if the Rockies and the Colorado River watershed had as bad a four-year period as we've had on the Sierras. But luckily, that hasn't, that hasn't happened, even though there has been drought within that area. Um, so you think about that and go, well, where, where's that going to come from? And so, I'm, um, so for them, they have to transform their water supply almost completely to get there. And so that means getting more out of their recycled water. That means looking at stormwater capture, um, which we're doing very, very poorly within, the, within this local region. Um, and uh, you know, doing better on conservation, as you said, obviously that helps the bottom line as well. Um, and getting more out of our groundwater basins. Um, even though they're highly contaminated, what can we do to actually get water out of them? So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, coming up. Um, but that's, that's a transformational change, yeah. So that's, that's a great question. So the question was, what about the risk of uh, overdraft for uh, groundwater basins? And you know, we, we keep hearing about or, or reading about um, what's been happening specifically in the San Joaquin Valley, where the degree of subsidence in the groundwater basin is, is, has been tremendous, some places 30, 40 feet. And what happens when you do that is you lose that storage capacity of that aquifer forever. You can't put it back. So in the LA region, what's interesting is we don't have an overdraft problem. Um, as a matter of fact, in LA, because of, <laughs> this is the weirdest thing you're ever going to hear, because of the contamination problem, we actually don't we don't withdraw the amount of water that we actually legally are allowed to. So our our groundwater basins, from the standpoint of a volume perspective, are actually looking pretty good right now. Little more stress in on the San Gabriel Valley area. But if you look at the San Fernando Valley, um, West Basin, Central Basin, they're both very, very healthy from the standpoint of the amount of water there. Now, that being said, one of the laws you may have caught that passed in the last couple of years, Fran Pavley um, was the author, um, state senator, uh, in the environmental conscience of the state of California and the legislature, is, is that she first ever groundwater management law in California. We were number 50 out of 50 states, yay, on even behind Texas on groundwater management. And, and the fact that we have a law, it basically isn't going to be implemented and of value um, really for about 20 years. Um, so maybe that's something that the drought's going to change. Um, it, it, but the, the way the law was written was it gives uh, local uh, groundwater management, the folks who have the water rights within, within those basins, the management responsibility first, and then they sort of provide uh, groundwater management plans to the state um, over the next two decades. But that's, that's just way too slow, and we can't afford to go that slow. But the key thing is, if you look, if you look at the, um, the aquifers, is basically, you know, we're so used to thinking of storage as being giant dams that are destroying some salmon river somewhere. And the reality is storage can be your aquifer. How do you get more out of it? And so if you put more in, you can pull more out. And right now, to be quite, it's called conjunctive use. And to be quite candid, we are not really doing that as well as we could within this region. Um, they, do, they do it a lot more aggressively, again, in the San Gabriel Valley. The most aggressive area in Southern California would be the Santa Ana um, River watershed. Where, um, so they have a, a Santa Ana watershed grip group um, that has been working together uh, for many years in managing the basins as a whole. And for them, they look at stormwater. Every single drop is precious. The end result is, if you've ever been in the Santa Ana River, people surf sort of on that Newport-Huntington border, if you've been down there, um, then you'll see there's really not much water coming out of the Santa Ana River, you know, 330 days a year because they're doing such a good job capturing it. San Gabriel River, they're also doing a decent job capturing it. But you know there's ecological impacts to that as well. Um, we don't need to get into that. that. That's just more stuff within the Sustainable City Plan on some of the goals. Um, let me, on the water supply, how do I blow this up? Um, all right, let me turn around and take a look. 
All right, so one of the things what we're doing on the research side, and I'm not going to bore you guys with too much of the detail here, um, is that we're looking at the whole city of Los Angeles and their water supply and what can they do to sort of get to these aspirational goals. Um, and so we're doing it on a watershed by watershed basis. And so the first watershed we're looking at is the Bayona Creek watershed. Um, you guys are almost in the Bayona Creek watershed here. Um, and so, uh, but if you look at the city of LA overall, um, where, where the water comes from and what the potential is. What this is, what we were looking at here was to say, look, if you look at the Hyperion treatment plant, right now, the way we've always dealt with wastewater on the coast is we got to treat it up, to, treat it to a level that complies with the Clean Water Act and make sure that it's not harming marine life or posing some sort of public health risk. Um, but we don't really look at our coastal sewage treatment plants as water supply. Um, and that's starting to change. Orange County obviously was the big lead on that with the Orange County Water District. And you've, you've heard about, um, you know, they have a 70 million gallon per day facility that takes, um, uh, takes uh, secondary treated wastewater. They run it through microfiltration, reverse osmosis, advanced oxidation. And by the end of it, you could literally drink it and it would, it, it would comply with every single of the Safe Drinking Water Act standards. But instead, they put it into the ground and then it commingles with the existing groundwater and then they pump it back up. Uh, but 70 MGD, it's a pretty big part of their water supply. So if you look at Hyperion and even with the amount of conservation that's going on right now, um, you could look at that and say, look, we can get maybe 200,000 acre feet out of that facility per year, which is enough for you know, over, well over a million people. Um, and so that's something that really looking at our coastal treatment plants more for water supply is, is something that we need to do. It's not just the small inland plants that have been really good on water recycling for a long time, although not so much in LA. Um, it really are it also these big treatment plants that are near the coast um, that have tremendous potential as well. And so we took a hard look at that um, and, and realized that you know, we could get 200,000 acre feet with conservation. I mean, that's, that's like 40% of LA's water supply if the conservation goals are met if you look out 20 years. So that's, that's a pretty big portion if we're saying how do we get water supply you know, to 50% plus by 2035. So that's just an example um, here. And so anyway, so I don't need to break down uh, Biona. On, um, this sort of gives you an idea of where things were in an average year in 2010. So back then, only 52% uh, of our water, that was like the last average year I think we had was 2010. Um, about half of our water was purchased from Metropolitan Water District. Uh, last year, it was over three, it was over three quarters. Um, and so when, when you see anything purchased from Metropolitan Water District, just realize it is coming from a, f a long ways away. So it's either coming from Bay Delta or it's coming from the Colorado, right? And so that's, that's, a, that's a big, big deal. Um, and LA Aquifer, like I said, because of the drought, is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So this year, I think last year, it was still up to 10%. Um, this year, it'll be lucky if it's 2%. Um, so there, there's just no water coming out of there. And so the city also has 2025 water portfolio goals. So they're trying to diversify how they're looking at water. They want to cut their met water you know, right, you know, down to 40% or less by that time frame. And you know, looking at stormwater capture, conservation, water transfers, um, uh, recycle water, those sorts of things. So a diverse portfolio is the direction everybody's going. In 2035, if you're going to get to 50% local, you know, one scenario could look like this, where a third of the water comes from Met, uh, you know, LA Aqueduct about 11%. But then we look at groundwater um, increasing dramatically, recycled water and stormwater increasing dramatically. So those are the sorts of things that people are talking about, changing where our water supply comes from in a, in a big, big way. Um, and so related to that, uh, some hot topics in water going down to the bottom, you have Proposition 1, uh, which everybody, you know, we voted for, two-thirds of the public who did decide to vote last November, um, voted to support Prop 1. It was $7.5 billion for water. And what was different about this water bond in comparison to other water bonds was that there was a real big focus on these local urban supplies. And so there's, as an example, for water recycling, there's more than $500 million um, in there for water recycling. You know, there's another 500 plus million for groundwater remediation. Um, 
and um, I think a similar amount for stormwater capture. And so if we think about that, and how do you, I think talking about groundwater remediation probably deserves another minute or two. So you keep hearing me say, oh, we need to get more out of our groundwater basins, but I'm also saying our groundwater basins are really contaminated. So you guys are probably going, what the heck? How, does, how do you do both those things? And so here's a situation where um, it's actually being done. Who here lives in Santa Monica? A lot of you guys. Hey, neighbors. Um, so in Santa Monica, in the mid-90s, the local water supply back then was 0%. And the reason why it was 0% was we had TCE contamination in our groundwater. We had P so trichloroethylene, we had perchloroethylene, and we had MTBE. So that's the additive, smog additive that you see in your gasoline. And so all of those got into our groundwater. MTBE is specifically troubling because it's, it's, it's very water soluble and, and incredibly difficult to remove from, from water. And so, what happened was Santa Monica took matters into their own hands. This actually its one of those great things. My wife is an engineer, water engineer in Santa Monica. This is her life, so I'll talk about her life. Um, is in, and they basically went after the polluters who polluted Santa Monica's aquifers. And they ended up getting, at this point, almost $400 million um, in, in, in settlement dollars to, to build treatment facilities so that they're now pumping contaminated groundwater from their aquifers. The Charnock Aquifer, if you know where Windward School in Mar Vista Park is. Um, so it's actually on the Windward School campus. Um, and then there's also uh, another treatment facility right at Bundy and Wilshire um, that you may have seen right across from Cafe Literati. Um, and so those two facilities, they take this contaminated groundwater and they run it through granulated activated carbon, among other treatment. Um, and then they actually provide drinking water quality water. So now Santa Monica, 70% of our water supply is local. Um, and the goal, and this is a policy that, that I helped put together with the city, I've chaired their environmental task force for 25 years, is, um, is how do we get to 100% local water supply by 2020? Um, and so that's through a con how do we make that 30% increment up? You know, a combination of conservation, um, which now of course is mandated statewide, um, but also uh, looking at other water sources as well um, uh, in doing so. So stormwater is, is an example. And if you've been to Santa Monica Pier and you've seen that little treatment facility right next to Santa Monica Pier, um, the Santa Monica Urban Runoff Reuse Facility, Smurf, have you guys seen that thing? All right, yeah, I know, it should be blue and white, right? But um, so that the Smurf uh, actually you know, treats water and they use it, they, it gets recycled um, for irrigation purposes, toilet flushing it. And, and various different other, other uses. So those are the sorts of things that are being done there. So we can do the same thing in LA. And so the place to do this in LA, we have a huge Superfund site in the San Fernando Valley, not too far from sort of the Universal City area, if you know that part. Um, so a lot of, a lot of um, we used to have a ton of aerospace sort of in that, that Burbank, San Fernando Valley area there. You know, and uh, because of that, a lot of the contamination's been there forever. People have been fighting in court back and forth. Super fun EPA really hasn't been able to get it much cleaned up there at all. And so finally, you know, after all these years and seeing the success story at Santa Monica, the city of LA is saying, we're going to do the same thing that Santa Monica is doing, but we're going to do it in LA and we're going to do it way bigger. Um, and so getting more out of the San Fernando Valley Aquifer, which is really the key to success for LA's water future. Um, means an awful lot. And so their hope is to get a lot of Prop 1 money out of that, at least a quarter billion, um, to help pay for that so it doesn't all fall on your DWP rates, but that the state's paying for it as well. And so look for that project to move forward within the next couple of years, and it's a big deal. And as long as I was talking about that aquifer and why it has so much potential, um, there's, there's more than 2 million acre feet of storage um, available for, for use within that aquifer. And we're barely scratching the surface on that use. Another aquifer that we barely scratched the surface on is West Basin. Any of you guys live in the South Bay? Not that many. Okay, wow. All right, so um, what's interesting there is uh, uh, about 30 million gallons a day from Hyperion water gets treated by the West Basin um, uh, Municipal Water District. Uh, they have a plant right off of uh, Sepulveda, 
um, called the Etsy Little Water Recycling Plant. And they also high, they highly treat the water to the point I take my students in my water class uh, to actually, they go to Hyperion and then they go to the Etsy Little Plant. And because it's advanced microfiltration, reverse osmosis, advanced treatment, advanced uh, oxidation, they drink the water at the end. So they, otherwise they don't get a grade for the day. No. But, um, <laughs> So, so that is very, very highly treated water, and it's used for seawater intrusion barrier water. So um, big concern is you have seawater infiltrates into your groundwater basins and contaminates the basin. Salt costs a lot of money to remove through treatment, huge amount of energy. Um, that's why if you hear about um, uh, ocean desal, very, very large energy costs. That's why it's about 22.50 an acre foot for the new Carlsbad plant that's going in near San Diego. Um, compared to uh, advanced treatment of wastewater would be about 1,400 an acre foot. So that's a pretty big difference, and it's all due to energy use um, in, in, in basically running it through the reverse osmosis, very high pressure needed. So there's this big plume of, of saline groundwater that's in West Basin that if that was actually pumped and treated, you would get an additional 600,000 acre feet of storage um, within the South Bay. I just bring up those numbers, they're huge numbers, because again, that's enough for more than City of LA's water supply for an entire year. So we barely scratched the surface on what we could be doing with our local groundwater basins, and that's really the point of me overwhelming with you with too many numbers. All right, so other hot topics in water that I'd be glad to talk about, um, you know, the mandatory 25 percent statewide target for urban areas. Um, that's been interesting in that, you know, the, the governor basically said, let's try it for a year voluntarily. Didn't work. What a surprise. Every single study would say that voluntary water conservation doesn't work. You might be able to get a few percent here and there, but overall it doesn't have a, a major impact. Um, and so we'll see how this goes now with these mandatory water budgets for each and every city. I think it's done a really good job just basically daylighting all the, the information and letting you know that, wow, Malibu uses a lot of water, or what about those water hogs in Beverly Hills? What do you think about that? You know, and sort of giving you an idea of comparing how some cities do on, on water conservation compared to others. Um, I can tell you off the record, they're like some people, boy, if you start doing that on an individual basis, I think that would really be a pretty hot thing to do, but it's illegal. <laughs> Uh, at this point, um, and uh, you know, but I've been told by some source in Santa Monica um, that you know there are some people who use more than three acre feet a year um, for one house, and you're just like, you got to be kidding me. That's enough. That's enough water for almost 20 people. And so, um, just to think that one house north of San Vicente, I wish I knew the address, um, uh, uses that much of, of water is pretty frightening. And to give you an idea about people who really have just way too much money to burn. You know, there's even a concern about people putting in their own wells, their own drinking water wells, um, into the local aquifer because, at least for ir getting irrigation water, it's not high enough quality for drinking water directly without treatment. Um, uh, and to do that because it's a, what's called a non-adjudicated basin under Santa Monica. So in other words, there hasn't been a judge who says who can and cannot take X amount of water out of that basin. So can you imagine having that much money where you're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to drill a well you know, in my own backyard and have that going. So that's, that's pretty scary things if that turns into a, a trend. Um, conservation, we've talked about the turf removal subsidies, 375 a square foot. I mean, that's, that's crazy, right? So turf terminators showed up overnight. They have almost 500 employees and they've existed for a year and a half. I know there's some good about them and some bad, but the fact that there's now an industry um, to do this in a big, big way um, is, is pretty exciting. How long those subsidies are going are gonna to last is a big issue. I don't know. I, I, I don't see 375 personally lasting for another year. So if you're thinking about doing it, I would do it right away if you want to get the most out of that. Um, the water budgets I touched upon uh, already, the fact that you, know, you have individual cities being told you know, you got to reduce 36% or 16% or 6%. You know, and I'm sure one of the things that has not been lost on, on this audience is the more affluent you are, the more likely that your city is wasting a lot more water. Um, and so the allocations um, are much more strict for a Malibu or, or um, a Beverly Hills than they are for, 
you know, obviously a Compton or something like that, um, because the water use is just is very, very uh, closely related to household income. And that's a that was a research study that was done at UCLA by Stephanie Pincel that really mapped that out um, very, very well, where it's like, you know, you see just in the city of LA, you see Brantwood and Bel Air, et cetera, and Palisades, enormous water use, um, even compared to some very dry, hot parcels in Reseda. Um, uh, but obviously, the household income in Reseda is much, much, much smaller compared to those other areas. Um, Fines, you've been hearing a lot about in the last week. Um, and, and so making that a true deterrent uh, is, is a big thing. I don't, I can't, I don't know how many $10,000 fines that are going to occur anytime soon. Um, I guess they felt that $500 fine wasn't adequate. The reality is someone's got to start giving fines for water wasting, and that really hasn't happened at all. On the rate structure side, this has been um, a hot topic that pretty much makes people's eyes glaze over, but in a weird way on conservation, it may be the most important of all the issues, at least in urban areas, which is there was a, a recent Fourth Circuit um, uh, appellate uh, decision, state court, uh, on San Juan Capistrano and their uh, conservation-based water rates, and the, the appellate court judge upheld the district court decision, which stated that uh, you, basically, you couldn't do uh, have a water waster rate um, in your block tiered structure. So if you guys pay, pay, I think you guys, if you're in the city of LA, if you're in Santa Monica, you know you have a four tiered rate. Um, and so there's four tiers, and so there's sort of the low two tiers, which are very cheap water, and then it ramps up pretty significantly, tier three. And then for tier four, you know, it's pretty much saying, you know what, you, you really should be paying through the gills for being such a water hog. Um, and what this basically said was not that that kind of rate was illegal, but that the cities needed to demonstrate that there was a direct nexus for the increase in rate for water hogs in comparison to the next tier. And that none, you know, the problem is none of the cities or water districts have really done much of a job on that. They've looked at this more from the standpoint of we want to force conservation. Um, and we also want X number of dollars to be able to operate the entire system. And the court said, you've got to do a lot better than that. Um, so that has just been absolutely chilling to um, water rate structures throughout the entire state um, and not being able to do as strong a conservation-based rate structure. Um, I can tell you, as someone who's worked on this both in, in LA and in Santa Monica and others, Santa Monica saw the writing on the wall. They decided that they weren't going to go for these extreme um, uh, uh, conservation-based rates, which I, wa I wanted like the top few rates to be like double, 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 you know, so you really pay a foreign shit. You know, if you want to grow a vineyard in your backyard, you should be paying a lot, you know, to do that is pretty much the way I look at it. Um, but with that court decision, there has to be substantiation for that. Like, you, you know, well, what additional infrastructure do we have to build? Do we have to capture stormwater, whereas before we didn't have to? You know, all those other sorts of things you need to take into account in economic analysis before moving forward with that rate structure. So what happened is you end up reverting to fines, and um, and so there were water budgets given to individuals. Maybe have you guys seen those on your water bills yet in Santa Monica? So you, you actually now have a water budget, and if you exceed that. Um, by a certain amount um, uh, for your billing period, you can actually get a fine. Um, and the cap for the fine for Santa Monica right now is $1,000 a year. Um, but that's the approach that they went. If you're a total water hog and you do this for seven billing periods, so that would be you know 14 months, right? Each billing period is two months. Then they could actually fine you up to $10,000 and shut off your water. Um, and that would make people take it seriously if all of a sudden you turn on the tap and nothing came out. Um, but those are the sorts of tools that are sort of being forced. You know, it's not the right tool maybe to use. I, th I think a block rate structure would be better. But this is kind of where things are because of that court decision. All right, so the next issue, agricultural water use. This is like the big issue that drives everybody nuts, right? Urban, we urbanites, we use how much water in the state of California? Everyone knows it by now, right? 20%. Right, so 20%. So it's 20 versus 80. So if we do our job and do a 25% reduction, then great. We've reduced California water use by 5%. That's great. 
So what do we, you know, and at the same time, you know, if we read one more story about, it's a gallon per almond, right? Did you guys get rid of all your almonds? You know, pistachios are worse. But um, walnuts are even worse. But the, the, uh, um, the, those, those sorts of issues have been interesting because the state, I think, has completely flubbed uh, how they're dealing with those issues. Lumping all cities together is stupid. Lumping all agriculture together is equally stupid. Um, believe me, the people in San Joaquin Valley, not all of them, different water districts have different um, uh, uh, water rights. So you, and I'm not going to bore you guys all with senior water rights versus junior water rights and what that all means, because that'll make people's heads explode or you'll go to sleep. But um, suffice it to say that water rights are a huge deal. and. Um, and so people with senior water rights are going to do a lot better than those with junior water rights. And so we've seen that those with junior water rights are getting cut off. And so their farms are basically are dying. Um, so it's not like the water's coming, you know, if they're in the San Joaquin Valley. Other areas that are really getting hit hard, um, you know, if you know people who, who are growing wine or, or other crops, um, you know, uh, uh, olives are pretty common out there as well in the central coast. Um, they're getting hit a lot because of, you know, basically they rely on local groundwater and they have a huge overdraft problem. So those guys are, um, a lot of those guys are in really deep trouble. And then you look at, I mean, to me, the area that drives me absolutely insane is the Imperial Valley. Everyone know where the Imperial Valley is? So that's like the hottest corner <laughs> of California. Um, and so our water rights from the Colorado River overall is 4.4 million acre feet per year. Urbanites, um, Metropolitan Water District, gets about 1.2 um, million acre feet a year from that. So Imperial Valley gets the rest. So that's like 3.2 million acre feet per year. They're growing alfalfa in the middle of the desert, you know, when it's 120 degrees outside. And you know why? Because they can. Um, the reality is they have the senior water rights on the Colorado River. And so short of some incredible legal action, uh, that's that's one of the big things. So when we want equity across the board, saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna cut our water use here as urbanites," we want to see the same thing in, in agriculture. The the tools that are really available to the state to force that to occur quickly are very very limited, and that's a huge frustration. And I'm equally as frustrated as all of you guys that that's the case. These guys they could cut way back, and then they could sell the water or store more of the water for the future. I don't know if you know, San Diego has their own deal with the Imperial Irrigation District, and that's where they get a lot of their water. That deal is expiring in 2017. It's going to be really fascinating to see what happens. I can tell you, who do you think the big loser in that whole thing is going to be? Salton Sea, man. Disaster. You think the Salton Sea is bad now? Um, the, uh, the amount of agricultural runoff that's going to go into that sea is going to get less and less and less, and that is the only water supply going into the Salton Sea right now. And so that is a very, very horrifying thought. If you thought the dust problems were bad up in, um, at Owens Lake, um, they're going to be at least that bad uh, at the Salton Sea if things are not done to actually remedy that situation. It's very fascinating to me with all this going on. The Salton Sea, it's been talked about a little bit, but how big of a crisis it is, I think, has been really shortchanged in, in the public eye and how those stories have been told. Um, so, so just keep that in mind. Um, there's a lot to do. So um, on ag use, I think there's there's more that the state can be doing. I think they should be doing they should be doing the same thing on water budgets. If if you've you've seen some writers, George Skelton, in LA Times, who said, okay, we should order people what crops they can and cannot grow. That's not going to work, you know, in this country. I just don't see that happening. But you can give water districts the same thing you're doing in the urban areas. Why not give them a water budget? And basically say you got to meet that budget. Even if you have the water rights, you got to meet the budget. And so I think that's something that needs to occur. And then lastly, I'll just say other solutions that, that would help. You might start seeing this more and more is net zero water. Hopefully we'll see something like this in Santa Monica as a leader on this very soon, which is for all new in redevelopment uh, to make sure that, um, that they would use 25% less water than the pre-existing development. And so even if somebody builds a much, you know, a big mixed-use project with uh, um, condominiums or apartments and those sorts of things, and it used to be a one-story, that they would be on the hook for reducing the, the water either on that parcel. And if they can't do it on their parcel, then they got to do it off-site within the city by a two-to-one multiplier. 
Um, and so that is a big, big, in, it, so in other words, it doesn't stop new and redevelopment, but what it does is it basically says, look, that whole issue of let's use water consumption to stop development, that goes away, because at least it says, look, you can do the same thing on greenhouse gas emissions as well, um, to, to have these net zero concepts um, for all new and redevelopment. So it's a, it's a cool concept that I think would really make a big difference. Um, and so we'll see how that goes. And I will spare you 218 reform. Um, so uh, with that, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, just because it's recorded, please use the microphone for your questions rather than have me walking around handing the microphone in the audience. Right. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask, if we cut water this much in the city of Los Angeles, it's hard for me not to imagine t uh, the temperatures going up all over the city. Like, you know, if we cut out the irrigation and all the grass right. and things like that. So are there efforts going on in parallel to like put in There are, and that's plants? a great question. So, so the question is, what's going to happen with the heat island effect? And so one of the things that came out, the very, very strong component in, in uh, Mayor Garcetti's sustainable city plan um, was on heat island. He actually had a heat island indicator. I can't remember what the exact temperature was, but actually for temperature reduction over time that um, was going to occur over the next 20 years. And I think it was about three degrees on, uh, in not everywhere, but in the most areas that have the most extreme heat island uh, effect. So how do you do that? So cool roofs um, is one way. So obviously, you know, we want white roofs instead of dark roofs. Um, and the same thing with cool streets. Um, so from the standpoint of you know, black tar uh, asphalt uh, pavement and turning that more into uh, wider streets, lighter streets, um, that's going to make a huge difference from the standpoint of helping on the, on the heat island effect. So those are the sorts of things I've been talking about. Yeah, you know, planting a whole bunch of thirsty trees isn't going to help us on the conservation side. So being much smarter on what our canopy is make, made up of. Um, needs to occur as well, as opposed to, well, we've had ficus on this block for 90 years, so let's keep doing that. You know, we got to be much smarter in, in what we're actually planting. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to just keep getting back in line so everyone has a chance. <laughs> um, you could I could do a quiz now. Yeah. <laughs> or I'll talk to you afterwards. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I promised people that I would report back with my findings. Um, so w one of the um, big things that's happened recently um, in, you know, on the UCLA campus and in Hollywood that kind of brought to light the fact that the infrastructure for the water is pretty crappy. It's yep. been there for uh, 100 years and not really maintained. What's being done about that? Because we lost a lot of water. I mean, maybe not a lot in the big picture, but a lot of fresh water. Yeah, we had 20 million gallons in Poly Pavilion. That wasn't really good for our basketball floor. Um, I don't know if that's what's impacting our recruiting, but um, it's not doing too well. But the, uh, the, the gist of it is, is that we've got, a, we've got a crisis, an infrastructure crisis in this country that's dramatic. And in LA, it, it, it's interesting. Department of Water and Power is probably the most hated agency. You know, DMV, used, IRS, people like them more than Department of Water and Power. So when you actually get to the point of saying, look, we really need a water rate increase so that we can actually have a system that um, you know, our current, their current pace of change out of their water infrastructure is once every 300 years. And that's not made up. Um, and so clearly, so the pace is we're not getting to it. And, and it's a huge problem. And so I, the city needs to be a lot more bold on, on infrastructure. And it, the problem is you're not going to see anyone you know, risk their political lives for DWP to do a water rate increase um, in, in, unless they have more trust in the agency. And so that's what they're working on right now. And I can tell you things are a lot better than they were a couple years ago. But are they, are they good enough to basically say, look, we need to do a water rate increase for our decaying infrastructure, to get more out of our recycled water, for stormwater capture, for the things that people want. If they, I, I really feel like if the public gets 100% assurance that the rate increase will go to all the things that they really want and they believe in, that that's what's needed to get the trust back. And so you're gonna, I, I think it'll have to be a very innovative rate structure. Um, otherwise, it's just gonna be like a one-year emergency thing, which isn't gonna be transformative, which is what's needed. Hi. Um, I mean, right now, it seems like a lot of people understand we need to have conservation 
I think generally people seem pretty supportive of Jerry Brown's statements that we're just doing mandatory water restrictions. You guys need to start conserving more. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be a problem if we do have a wet winter? Everyone's going to go, oh, OK, we're done now. Uh, and yeah, I they're, do. They're not going to actually understand <laughs> we don't, we, we're not really the, this this is this is why it, at least I'm optimistic about things like you know you know this whole concept of you know it's bad to have a lawn um, that, that at least if you're if you're changing out and planting natives that's a permanent solution if you're putting in new water conserving technologies that's a permanent solution so the fact that we're not doing anything that's permanent on the ag side is concerning to me so even if it was basically saying well let's use this and we're gonna let's use the bond dollars, the 7.5 billion, and we're gonna do conservation retrofits in the most water wasting of our agricultural parcels. And we're not gonna do it on a voluntary basis, we're gonna actually come in and do it, right? I think that sort of aggressive approach is needed. Otherwise, yeah, it is human nature. It's like, oh yeah, you know, so much for climate change. We had a cold winter in New England, you know? And so we've seen that, snowballs on the floor of the Senate, come on. So, um, so that's the sort of thing. I, I, I agree with you. That's why permanent solutions are critical, not just behavioral change. Hi. So I have another <clears throat> kind of an infrastructure question with the recycled water. Sure. Uh, so you know, I, I noticed, at least in our city, that a lot of the parks are irrigated with recycled water and was wondering if there's any chance that that would extend to houses, or would that just be cost prohibitive trying to run a whole new set of uh, water lines? Now, what's interesting about that, so what's what's held up the city, there's a lot of things that's held up the city of LA on water recycling. One is Department of Water and Power and the Bureau of Sanitation are completely separate and often competitive against each other. So Bureau of Sanitation treats the wastewater, DWP sells the water. And so that's been an issue. Um, why would Bureau of Sanitation treat the water to a higher level if they don't get the economic benefit of selling the water? So the, those things need to be worked out. Now that being said, purple pipe costs a lot of money. Laying any sort of pipe costs a lot of money, and that's the recycled water pipe. I can tell you, based on the research that we've been doing on this, the City of LA project, I came in here thinking purple pipe was uh, going to be a real major part of the solution. The more and more I think about it, um, better utility of, of our groundwater aquifers is far more cost effective and far smarter and allows us to store during good times and bad times. And we're not getting the most out of that. So if you look at a Hyperion building a whole bunch of purple pipe to apply a Vista um, or to, uh, it has really not amounted to much of anything. I mean, it's like a million gallons per day coming out of Hyperion, um, which is a joke. Um, and and that includes LMU and Westchester and you know the golf course right there. There just has not been very much use on recycled water. They've not, the quality of the water is not as good as it should be because of there's, the volumes are low and they've actually had regrowth problems in the pipes, a little bit of odor issues. It's high quality coming out of treatment, but not by the, by the time you turn on the pipe, you're like, whoa, what's that smell? So to me, better utilization um, a better future for us would be getting more out of our groundwater basins and, and, and really, you know, either through injection or infiltration, um, putting it in the groundwater and then pulling it out and commingling. Oh, hi, thank well, you. It was probably intentional because I was getting blind. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you for coming to Google again. Uh, yeah, I, I would like uh, to ask uh, to elaborate a little bit more on the Imperial Water District uh, swap <laughs> they did with San Diego. Sure. Uh, what is the size of this deal? Uh, maybe explain why is it so controversial, and what's your general view on this kind of uh, swap or monetizing of sea and water rights? All right, so the question was on Imperial. And uh, so that deal was negotiated about a decade ago. And um, the overall view, uh, just getting to that point, of, of uh, agriculture selling their water supply to urban areas, is that it's okay, um, that water's water, and, and, and if someone needs it more than you do, then that's fine, and, uh, and so that's a good thing. Um, there was uh, specific requirements in there and how much went to San Diego, and then how much went to the Salton Sea, and it, you know, with the water pressure being what it is right now, 
there's a big, big concern on whether or not the Salton Sea would get any allocation whatsoever. So the loser in this whole thing will not be San Diego because San Diego will be able to pay more for water. I mean, heck, they made the commitment to 22.50 an acre foot for Carlsbad, you know, for 50,000, uh, what is it? Um, how many acre feet a year? 50,000 acre feet a year? I think 50,000 acre feet a year out of that facility. And they're about to make a $3 billion commitment to taking water recycling to the next level um, and actually going to what's called a different type of indirect potable reuse um, where, where you know, I've been talking a lot about where you actually treat water to a high level, put it in groundwater, and then it commingles, and then you pump it back up, but you get you know, soil benefits there. They're actually looking at, because there is no significant groundwater in San Diego, they're actually looking at surface water reservoirs and combining high, highly treated um, advanced oxidation uh, uh, recycled water with um, surface water and reservoirs. So that's the direction they're going. But some people have gamed the system in a big way, and that's where you see anger. You know, where um, you, know, you know, where people who aren't really farmers but really are just out to make a buck as as much as possible, um, you know, are are getting very very cheap water um, based on some rates that old water water rights rates from many many decades ago, and then just making a fortune on reselling it for an order of magnitude or more um, for urban areas, and that sort of opportunism. Uh, without any sort of regulation is has been a big concern as well. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions. Uh, so uh, what about the policy cost waste, uh, say like uh, Santa Monica? Uh, I, one day I saw them uh, using uh, high pressure water to yeah. wash the uh, walkway because mm -hmm. there's a law uh, preventing people from uh, using the air blower. And that, uh, when, that looks to me totally nonsense. And uh, what about that from? Yeah, you know, this is the problem when you've got environmental issues. It's not as simple as like, let's just focus on water and ignore air. So they, they banned leaf blowers because of um, the, the impacts on, on people with asthma um, and breathing. Because, you know, a lot more dust in the air and, and there's noise pollution, et cetera. And so they ended up going to these um, the city uses these very, very high pressure washers. They try to recover the water to some extent. Because remember, if you look at, a lot of people don't realize this, that water is all going to the Santa Monica urban runoff um, uh, recycling facility. So, there, so even though you may see it flowing down the drain, they actually are able to capture it and treat it and reuse it. But that's not true in most cities. So you're bringing up an interesting point, which is why the requirements under the, um, the county stormwater measure is that uh, there's a, a county stormwater permit, is that these high pressure uh, washers can have to be um, water efficient. And I can't remember what the exact numbers are on, on gallons per minute, but it's very, very low. Um, and so that's been a response because it's definitely illegal to use just a regular hose to wash off debris. So it might not be a satisfactory answer to you, but that's, that's sort of the genesis of where it came from. Last question. Yeah. Well, I have so Sorry, you don't get your list. <laughs> Maybe I'll talk to you afterwards. Um, so has anybody done any kind of study to determine whether or not in, um, in this like very uh, extreme drought or, or exceptional drought areas, it makes more sense for people to use disposable dishes and silverware rather than washing dishes? Haven't heard it. It's Haven't an interesting heard question, look at it. though, right? Like, because it depends on where those things are being made. Obviously, when you make paper products, it takes a lot of water to make um, to make paper products. But if it's not here, then it's someone else's problem. Like, if you do it on the East Coast, they've got lots of water. <laughs> yeah, no, this embedded water question is a really good question. And um, I think people are thinking a lot more about that, as you know, about food. You're starting to see a lot of that publicized more, you know, on... You know, it's not just the animal. I can tell you, my son, Zach, went vegetarian um, his freshman year at, at, in college, not because for animal rights purposes, but it was strictly because of water. Um, and I'm going, you know, so it was pretty interesting. So because of him, I gave up. I gave up beef and pork, so I gave up meat. I'm not going vegetarian right anytime soon. But you know, I get the water basis and the embedded water part. You know, and I'm wearing jeans, you know, which aren't great either. So uh, your point is a good one. I have not heard even the most uh, extreme situations where that has occurred. 
you know, I mean, obviously you see people, you, know, you don't give people water unless they ask for it in a restaurant and those sorts of things we all see. Same thing for towels and sheets and all these other sorts of things in hotels. But I have not seen to the point of saying, we're giving you disposable um, uh, paper uh, plates and those sorts of things to save water within our region. So it's, it's an interesting way of thinking of it because embedded water is something that um, we need to really appreciate a great deal more. All right, thank you.